Well, let's just get right to it. But before we do, I want you to think of some tutorial that you've ever used. I want you to think of anything, a technical guide, some documentation, really any learning resource. Think of some learning resources you've used in the past. It could be a written blog, it could have been a video, anything that you have used to learn something uh, that you did not already know. And as you're thinking about these resources, as you comb through your history of all the things that you've learned, I want you to dig a little deeper. Think about what the best learning resources were that you've ever used. And then think about the worst learning resources that you've ever used. What are the differences there? What are the characteristics that you can point out about why one was really, really good and why one was really, really bad? What sparks your memory and what makes you recall specific pieces to be bad or good? As you start thinking of those things, I want to actually talk to you about them because it's those exact missing pieces that will turn those really bad pieces of learning resources into great ones. So as Scott said, I'm Adrienne Taka, Senior Developer Advocate for MongoDB, and we're going to get right into it. So the bad. We've all hopefully, or maybe not hopefully, but I'm sure have encountered a lot of really bad learning resources. They are pretty bad because of a very specific thing. And that specific thing can be characterized into two very specific characteristics. And that's most bad learning resources are unclear and unhelpful. And unclear and unhelpful is at the root of all of these resources that we think of when I ask you to think of a really bad learning resource. But unclear and unhelpful are also just two words, right? They, like, you know what they mean. You know that unclear could mean confusing. You're probably like Jack Skellington, Skellington here saying, you know, what does it mean? I'm trying to learn it, but it doesn't make sense to me. And unhelpful is another pretty clear visual reminder of how we feel when we read or go through these bad learning resources. But there are some things that we do that we can try to avoid that actually fall even more granular into these. And so that's our, what I want to talk to you today. These are the missing pieces that I see over and over and over again, myself included, as I write my initial drafts and things that I look for when I try to create some sort of learning resource. And so we'll start with SMH IDK. And if you're going, okay, what is SMH IDK? That's, that's exactly the point. SMH IDK, um, you know, for those in the texting generation, you should probably know it's shaking my head, I don't know. And at least that's how I understand those very particular abbreviations. But we see this all the time in so many of our learning resources. If you look through documentation, if you look through demos, if you look through anything that is supposed to be teaching the reader something, we see these all the time. And so you get sentences like, to create a TTL index on this field, use the following command. Or the CRI is an API for container runtimes to integrate with Kubelet on a node. Or whether you're using the MERN, MEAN, or MEVIN, MEVIN stack, this tutorial will be useful to learn the fundamentals. And just like earlier when, you know, if you may not have known what my title meant, SMH IDK, that's exactly the same feeling that your learners are going through if they're unfamiliar. They may not uh, know these things just because they haven't been in the industry long. They might have been switching from a different um, industry or have experience in some other places other than tech. They might be coming from another country where these uh, and background and culture where all of these initials and abbreviations mean something else. And so when you take a look at the acronyms that we've seen here and the abbreviations that we have, TTL, what could that mean? 
does that mean transistor transistor logic because that's exactly what that means uh, in another industry does it mean the actual 1969 french film that's directed by bernard paul which is also the same name of the actual thing here it could be depending on who you are and depending on what your background and experience is but in this particular case and in this particular sentence it does mean time to live and time to live indexes but you want to be explicit about that. You want to not have any ambiguity. You want to make sure that you know and you tell your uh, readers what you mean when you're writing your documentation or creating that video. Uh, here it applies more to written word because you see it. Um, and so being more explicit is always better. It's the same thing. Let's take CRI and API, for example. CRI can mean, again, a whole multi multitude of things. Does that mean color reversal internegative? Because that's actually a thing, and that just means a motion picture film duplicate or a negative. Um, does it mean Croce Rossa Italiana? Which, that's also a thing. It's the Italian Red Cross. Or how about if you have a background in medicine or someone is switching from the medical field? CRI might, f the first thing that comes to mind when they hear CRI is chronic renal insufficiency which is a kind of a, a symptom of chronic kidney failure. It could be all those things, and it most likely doesn't mean that in the context of a tech tutorial or a tech learning resource, but again, it's always better to be explicit. In this case, in the sentence I showed you, it means container runtime interface. Uh, and specifically, it's the container run runtime interface uh, that's related to Kubernetes. Uh, and the same thing right here, API, Application Programming Interface. Now, you might be saying, well, Adrian, you know, if you are any have been in tech any sort of time, if you've been in development at all, you'll know what an API is. You'll, you would have seen it. You would have worked with it. And that may be true. That may be so prevalent in the industry and what we do that it's always kind of nice to just assume that everyone will know what that means. Uh, and even if that's the case, the very minimum that you can do is at least spell it out the first time, especially if it's a tutorial or a learning resource that's geared towards beginners. But even then, even if it is some intermediate one, take make sure you keep in mind the people who are switching industries and people who are career transitioners and even people who maybe in the tech industry, but are completely going into a new technology they may not have used before. For all of those people, spelling it out is always much better. And if you spell it out at least once the first time, then it's a much better and clearer way to refer to them uh, and a bit better to use the acronym later on throughout the rest of your learning resource. And finally, we all know these, right? Or again, that's the assumption, but MERN, MEAN, MEVIN. Uh, if you haven't been in the web development space or you just haven't heard any of these acronyms, again, it's just better to spell it out. Be explicit. Make no mistake about what you're talking about in your learning resource. Spell it out that these mean Mongo Express node with the third letter being the JavaScript front-end framework that you are using, which is React, Angular, or Vue. So that's SMH IDK, or shaking my head, I don't know. Uh, and that's something that we really should try to, at a bare minimum, try to watch out for. The next thing that is really frustrating when it comes to tutorials especially, or demos that you're trying to build yourself if you're following along, is something I call the step skipper. And so I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Uh, it's a parody video. It's called Every Programming Tutorial Ever. So it's this person and he's, he's like, okay, we're going to just, you know, import this and we're going to import this old ass library from 1994. Oh, and halfway through it says, by the way, we're using Java 7, not 8. And then I'm just going to copy and paste this entire huge chunk of code. Uh, you know, it just, it makes your computer do stuff and then compile it and then bam, we have Minecraft. <laughs> Uh, and that one really, really gets to me. It's hilarious to me, but it's also, there's a lot of truth in it because a lot of the tutorials that we see and may have even encountered ourselves are like this. This is a very, you know, uh, a satirical version of it, but it's not hard to find tutorials that are like this. 
they go, you know, create this listing or create this thing, right, as an example, very generalized, and then add this code, and then ta-da, you should be up and running now. And that's kind of the mode and the kind of the uh, expectation that they set when they create these kinds of learning resources. And that is extremely frustrating for somebody because have you ever gone through some uh, tutorial like this where you're following along, you're you know, going down step by step, and then as you get to a particular step, you find yourself looking at something completely different than what is being shown on the tutorial. It says this is where you should be at, or this is what it should look like, or this is the, th this is the state it should be in uh, by the time you reach this step. But as you look at your own monitor and you look at your own screen, it's not the same. That is extremely frustrating and very demotivating whenever anyone's trying to learn something new. So that is something that we want to avoid, um, not only because it is frustrating, but because it's very unclear. You don't know if uh, the tutorial itself is missing steps or if you have forgotten something on your own. So in this case, again, being explicit is always best. And it's also part of our responsibility to make sure we call those steps out. We make sure they're all there. So in reality, most tutorials actually benefit for, from more steps or at least some good call outs on points that you might feel might be conf uh, confusing to a, a learner. If you anticipate those points and if you see there's a really good place here to put a good tip or reminder to make sure you're um, uh, holding the hand of the learner that you are teaching, it's always better to have that kind of flow and to make sure they feel like they know what they're doing and know where they're supposed to be rather than just um, assuming and skipping steps, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So in this case, maybe there was something that needed to be set. And for a lot of us, sometimes these are already, you know, default settings. We go through so many configurations, install so many things that a lot of our machines, they're always going to be different. So if this is something that is critical to the thing that you're trying to teach, make sure to point that out or at least call it out and say that this is something to check that might influence uh, what you see in the next step. Similarly, uh, if there are any good tips, uh, things that might seem too obvious, Things like, you know, replacing the placeholders in the code snippets that you provide because, you know, you didn't add an actual production connection string in your code snippet. You put a placeholder because you intend for your learner to replace it with their own. Or, uh, you know, you do this so often that you know that you have to hit deploy, you have to hit save, you have to do something. And it's such a uh, as a, a teacher and as someone who is used to it, you these are the kinds of steps that we try we tend to forget, and so it's always important to try to remember that. Uh, and a great way to ensure that you don't forget these steps is to go through it yourself, really go through it yourself, and make sure everything that you see is as expected and matches what you are sharing and teaching in the learning resource that you are providing. So that's the step skipper. The next thing is something I like to say, you know, foo your foo bar, and I'm sure you probably can infer what this means. But another really annoying thing, at least to me, and at least to a lot of very new people or just anyone trying to learn, is the use of foo and bar and just having it interspersed everywhere. It's very common on Stack Overflow. It's even common when you're trying to explain, you know, a question you have uh, and or trying to uh, write some uh, pseudocode uh, very quickly to prove a point to ask a question that you're trying to ask. But again, these are very you know, for somebody new and until now, whenever I see these kinds of names, I'm just I just glaze over because why not just be explicit? Why not just say what it is, especially if you're trying to get some help on a question that you have and you're trying to set the context? What better context than to just be explicit with your variable names, be explicit with what you're actually trying to say, because then instead of writing an additional paragraph about what you mean, 
it's right there in the code. Uh, and this applies not just to our code uh, in general, but also to our code snippets that we share in our tutorials or our learning materials. And it, it applies to anywhere we're trying to teach something. A very specific aspect of this and something that I didn't know I was already kind of doing naturally because I'm a more verbose person, uh, is something that a, a developer called Chris Dunn calls the German naming convention. Um, and as I'm sure that most of you who speak German know or are familiar with the German language, there are a lot of compound words that can be formed. And sometimes they can be super long and super explicit and sometimes really funny. But the point is that's what we want in our code snippets. That's what we want in our code. We want them to be so explicit that there's no ambiguity and that no matter how many times you come back to this, you come back to this six months from now, a year from now, you share this with somebody, you will always know what you're talking about. And that's always better than any of this foo bar nonsense. The next thing that is very unclear in a lot of tutorials and learning resources I see is something I say, or um, that's something I call, tell me what I need. Uh, and we kind of saw this in the parody earlier uh, of the video with every programming tutorial ever where he goes in the middle, he's like, oh, by the way, yeah, we're using uh, Java 7 um, instead of this particular thing. And if you've ever gone through something like that, you'll know how frustrating that is to get halfway through or almost all the way through and you don't realize you need something that is critical to the tutorial. So there's no better place than in the very beginning of any of your learning resources to tell the learner what they need. What do they need? They need, to me, at least five things. Or if they, re if they apply to the learning resource that you're creating or writing about or uh, creating a video for, um, they need to have most of these at the beginning. Tell me what background knowledge will be helpful before starting this tutorial. Tell me the prerequisites. Tell me, is this going to go over my head because I don't have the basics of some particular technology or, or programming? Because if I go into it, uh, it's just going to be demotivating because it's going to be overwhelming and it's not the right type of learning resource for me at the level that I am at right now. Tell me, what dependencies do I need to download? Again, if it's, there's nothing more frustrating than getting through ha being, you know, a, some part of the way in, and then you have to have a big blocker because you don't have the dependencies that your tutorial needs, or you're taking a super long time finding and collecting and making sure you have it to even get started. So by making sure that it is already uh, explicit in the beginning and making sure people are aware of what they need, they can get to that faster and get through your learning resource much quicker. Tell me, can I complete this on a free tier? As we've unfortunately seen with that story of a student who incurred really, really high bills on this uh, from on AWS, it is certainly the responsibility of these cloud providers to make sure that that doesn't happen. But another part, until that actually you know is resolved, uh, another part as, as being teachers, it's our responsibility to make sure we let our learners know that if anything that we're doing might cost something, that they need to know that. They need to know they can't go through the tutorial halfway through and then not be able to finish it because they need a higher tier than the one that you've been showing them. It is our responsibility to let them know, hey, delete these resources at the very end of this tutorial if you don't need it. Otherwise, you might incur some costs. It's part of our responsibility to make sure that we let our learners know um, all of this information and make sure it's a part of every learning resource we create. Tell me if some steps need to be completed before I start. If you're if your learning resource is a part of a series or it requires something to be fully set up before moving on to the next step, again, it's just common courtesy and also a much nicer experience for the person who is following this learning resource to get through it and actually increase the chances of them finishing it because it's clear 
what they need before they're able to accomplish and achieve the next step. <clears throat> and finally, tell me that an estimate of how long this should take. A lot of us are probably learning things on our own time, our free time, and it's always useful to be able to say, I need to set aside you know, an hour or two to get through this learning resource. The more that you can, more information you can give about the learning resource you're about to share, the better that uh, you're able to um, get through all of these things much safely. So another thing here is something I call random screenshot who dis. And so if you look at this first glance, you'll see, well, oh, it looks like a pretty good screenshot, right? It seems helpful, right? But it's a very uh, tricky one and it could be a double-edged sword because for screenshots, if you sometimes you see screenshots that don't support what you're trying to explain or they're paired with the incorrect step and that's completely confusing. Sometimes it shows a different result than the one that you are describing in your written steps. Or uh, if they are images, the alt text does not provide any meaningful detail or worse, it doesn't use it at all. And again, all of these are all obstacles. They're all hurdles that make it much harder for someone using your learning resource to use it effectively. So instead, we should only add these screenshots if they do provide some clarity. If the visual is better than writing an extra paragraph or it does give that clarity in your tutorial, uh, add it. And then again, it's a part of our responsibility is to have that due diligence to make sure that our screenshots are in the right place. And a, a thing I like to do is to name screenshots to match the step number. That way I know where it goes as I'm formulating it. And again, follow your own steps and recapture the actual results if necessary. If you find that the screenshot you initially captured doesn't match, either again, go through the due diligence to make sure you get the right screenshot. Or if you're really in a bind, you can use Photoshop to kind of show it, but make sure it's not so obvious that it's Photoshop. And then finally, in alt text, at a minimum, describe the relevant points of the image that is required for the learner to be able to complete the step. So those are all of the things that make our documentation or learning resources unclear. The next few things are things that I think make them unhelpful. They just don't do anything for it. And so uh, one thing that is super common is um, something I call, oh, you didn't know that. And a lot of tutorials do this, and that's this is kind of the baseline. When you create a learning resource, there's always this assumption that you make that your reader has either some knowledge or a little bit of knowledge or is aware or just has some kind of baseline knowledge about the topic that you're trying to present. When really what you should be doing is assuming your reader has no knowledge at all. That's why we want to be explicit. That's why we want to make sure that any additional things that they need to know are told to them beforehand and any other things are, um, you know, you go into detail about them before you continue on in your resource. Another thing that is very prevalent uh, in very unhelpful learning resources is something I call no more 404s. So you'll see some verbiage in your documentation or um, some demo. And as you're reading through, you'll see, oh, here are some really fancy and great links that will help aid in my learning. But when you start to go through them, you realize, oh, this one's actually broken and outdated. Oh, this one doesn't work either. It redirects me to something else or it redirects me to the home page. This one is not available. These are extremely detrimental to the learning experience, especially if these links require you or these links are supposed to encourage the, the reader to um, continue on on the learning process or if they are required to um, finish the tutorial. So please, please, please make sure that your links are all working and there are a lot of tools that you can use to make sure that uh, they're not um, broken links. 
Uh, another unhelpful thing that I see a lot is something I call jump to recipe. So if you've ever seen any of these uh, recipe sites, bloggers who do this, you'll see, you know, you just want a recipe for banana bread, right? But they tell you like their life story. There's all these pictures like uh, teasing you of what you're actually about to create. But then you're just like, all right, I just, I need the recipe. I want to make this right now. <laughs> and so that's, uh, you'll see as this person continued their blog, they added this really cool thing called jump to recipe. And so you can skip all of the fluff, skip all of the things that are not relevant to you and just get straight to the cooking, get straight to the baking, tell me what I need, tell me how to do it. And that's the same kind of mentality that we should have when we create especially longer tutorials. So having quick jump links are super useful because when people are trying to solve a problem or are trying to do something, you don't know what, what um, state they are in in terms of solving their problem. And again, especially if it's a fairly complex problem or a long problem or a long tutorial that you're creating, quick jump links are always helpful because readers can then skip directly to what they need. Uh, and this is always, um, you know, it might come across your mind because I just said, you know, you need to make sure all the prerequisites are at the beginning and make sure they are aware of it. Uh, but it's always uh, good to be able to add those prerequisites, at least those that are needed prior to the actual step that they're jumping to, to cover those cases in case they use the quick jump functionality. Next uh, is something I like to call not now Jiffy. <laughs> and if you've ever, you know, worked with tutorials or seen videos on YouTube, any learning resource, um, you'll find, uh, you know, a lot of people like to use GIFs. And yes, I say it GIFs, so we can argue about that later. <laughs> But um, I also really like to use them because it evokes feeling to me. It's a, it's a helpful thing, right? If you're going through a tutorial and you're working with your learner and you're stepping them through, walking them through, you might give them a little encouragement with a, a woohoo uh, gif at the end or to convey, you know, you really feel and can relate to them when you're about to talk about a topic that was confusing to you. And so you might throw one of these in there or you add in some kind of joke because you're talking about how difficult CSS is. Uh, you know, you start adding all of these little one-offs. You start showing these reaction GIFs of what you might feel like. You start throwing all these kinds of things in. And at the very end, you're kind of left with, okay, what exactly was I doing in the first place? Some, you know, I'm not saying these things are bad. I'm saying there are tutorials and learning resources out there where it's like every other slide is a GIF. And sometimes you want to just get straight to the point. Sometimes you just want to know, what do I have to do? Let me get through this uh, and let me actually complete this learning resource. And if you use too many of these, they can act as distractions rather than the support or the help that you might think you are adding to them. So what I advise in this case is really, if you really want to use it, make them, make them work for it, right? Make sure to do maybe one at the very end. Really make it worth it. Make sure it's not in the middle of your steps. Make sure it's not distracting. Uh, and less is always more in this case. And finally, the uh, perpetual problem, which should not be as problematic now, but it's the it works on my machine issue, which is extremely unhelpful, especially if you're creating learning resources. So we've all heard this before, but it's especially frustrating when we see it in a tutorial we're trying to follow. You know, you think you found the right thing, the perfect thing that's gonna solve your problem or teach you the right th thing or teach you the um, thing that you're trying to learn. And as um, this is uh, something that we see all the time, right? Is, oh, sorry, this tutorial only works with Windows because the learner who created it probably is on a Windows machine and has only ever gone through it that way. 
or the simple repo relies on version 3.2.6 and you know that's very detrimental because no other version is going to work unless it's those or this rest the worst ones i've seen is the rest of this guy assumes that you're on a mac it's just going to say all right if you don't have this then you're you're not going to be able to use this learning resource that's what i read and so the best thing we can do is to take all of these things and make it as platform agnostic as possible. And something like Docker, which is an industry standard, helps take these things away. It's a little more effort on our part, but it is always much more helpful to the reader. And so if we recap as quickly as possible, because I think I am at time, the bare minimum for the best type of learning resources we can create is to do things to make them concise and valuable. So instead of those uh, abbreviations and acronyms, spell them out. Check your steps before you wreck yourself. Make sure all the steps are there, are appropriate, and are not missing anything. Use the German naming convention. Stop using foobar. Tell me what I need and tell me first, because they're the most important things before I even start this tutorial. Make sure screenshots make sense in the context of where you're adding them. Make sure that they do know that. Make sure the things that you're talking about and the assumed knowledge that you think your readers will have is somewhere in your tutorial or has a link to some suggested reading before continuing on with your learning resource. Repair those links. Make sure they don't uh, affect the learning experience. Add quick jump links and get on with your day and make your learners get on with their day too. Make sure they get to the stuff that they need right away. And then just a little jiffy for a snack, not to distract. Try to not use too many where it's detrimental to your tutorial. And finally, strive to make sure that it works on all machines. Because with all of these steps, these become the best pieces of what could have been your worst pieces of documentation or learning resources or tutorials. But when you keep in these in mind and make sure to strive for these, uh, they will certainly be a lot better for your readers and learners. And that's it. Salamat. That means thank you in Tagalog. Um, thank you very much, Berlin Buzzwords, for listening to my talk. And I hope you have enjoyed this and learned something. I'm free for questions if there's still time. <laughs>